Hello and welcome to At The 55, your home for OUA football. Me and Tom are back on the mics with an incredibly special guest joining us today. Tom, the honor's got to be all yours, so how the heck are you doing, my friend? Oh, I am doing so damn well because the man of the hour, the guy we have with us, Mr. OUA MVP himself, number 13 on the field, number one in your heart, Mr. Taylor Elgersma. How you doing, my man? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm excited. That's <laughs> it's, it's, of course, our pleasure. It's our honor. Taylor, of course, we've met a few times um, over the years, and we've got you on, gotten you on the pod going back now, darn near three years ago when you were a rookie back in 2021. And, and so much has changed, not just in the OUA, but just with you making your mark here. Um, but, you know, the one thing I want to talk about off the jump, we see what you do week in, week out for the Laurie Golden Hawks. And, you know, Jack Jack Moore gives us the, you know, the Josh Allen comp and everyone can look at what you can do, run the ball with the touchdowns, all these incredible things. We'll get to that. But we have you for uh, only, you know, an hour and change because you've got to get some basketball tonight. Who is the <laughs> NBA comp in your mind when you're stepping on the court tonight? You're lacing them up. Maybe you got the armband, whatever the swag is when you're hooping. Who is it that when you look in the mirror, you're like, yeah, everyone sees Taylor Algersma, but I see blank. Who's that guy? I mean, I'd love to give myself a better comparison and say Jokic or something <laughs> like that. But I, I got to be honest, though, on our uh, we have an intramural basketball team with our guys here. I'm more of like the Draymond Green guy. I'm the glue guy. I, <laughs> I'm hustling, I'm grabbing boards, I'm doing what I can, but I'm not I'm not scoring too many points out there for the boys. Hopefully not kicking anyone in the nuts while you're at it if you're doing the full dream on thing. <laughs> no, no. Can, uh, oh man. So I want to kick things off here. Going into a season like how you guys had this past year, obviously it didn't end the way that you wanted it to, but this was still a very special Laurier team. Comparing this past season to 2022 and even 2021 in your first year, what were some of the differences that when you walked into training camp, if there were any, that you made you feel, hey, you know what, we have something here. This this team has some something special. I think it's just the culture and the confidence in our locker room. Like um, you can see it building. Like uh, in 2021, it was Galloway's first year with our offense, and um, kind of like not changing the guard, but like kind of us turning over uh, into a new kind of you know, stepping into where we're going to go with our new class and stuff like that. And I just think every year we've kind of seen us progress and build. And I think going into last year, we had a lot of confidence from 22 of like, we know what we can do. We know how good we're going to be. And like the culture was set of like, we have the expectation to go in and win the eights cup. And that's kind of like where it came from, from jump for us is we knew we were going to end up in the eights cup. Obviously it didn't end up the way we wanted it to, but we had that confidence that we were going to be there at the start of the year. And so I just think it's a culture thing and it's kind of like happens with that new wave of guys that come in. And this is kind of like, this was kind of like our, our group of guys is like time, I guess I would say. And you know, it's the thing we were talking with Jack more about that. We've talked about with so many of these teams where, especially with college ball, with the exception of the, the handful of teams and all the major, you know, you sport um, where, you know, they're going to just cycle in players year in, year out, finding that piece where it's like, all our guys are hitting that peak. And, and that's why, you know, it's so exciting seeing what you guys have going there. But when you mix it in as well with, you know, a, 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 a scratch it out, clawed out battle week one against Queens, and you have the following week against a Carlton team that, you know, you had seen the playoffs the year before. Um, and obviously they, they proved throughout the season to be a pretty formidable match more than perhaps, uh, you know, casual viewers um, and people outside that building perhaps thought. And then you really hit your stride and, you know, there's a there's a moment where, you know, you have me and Tom kind of being like, oh, you know, El Grisma hasn't got a passing touchdown yet. You know, it's like Jack got a super hype to all these things. And, and then all of a sudden, like the Guelph game happens, the like you, you, you string off this this run of games. And there's a lot of things to kind of pick apart from that. But the number one thing I want to kind of lean into, because we've been talking about this for a bit, is that how instructive was it? being in some tight battles early you obviously have games or you're hanging like you know big numbers on teams but being able to look through the course of your season and say you know what we were able to barely sneak out of of richardson stadium with a win week one huge statement win we're fighting you know tooth and nail against the carlton team coming off of the week one buy if memory serves for them and having those moments then be able to come down the line and say no we, we've we've been in games this hasn't all just been us just you know air rating on teams uh you know to put up these big numbers yeah and i think you know obviously it's it'd be nice if every single game you know we went out there and we walked teams and we you know put up the numbers that we know we we want to be able to put up but 
you know, these are all good teams that are playing in this league. And, like, we know that. And so, like, after week two, it was just, like, we're 2-0. and That's the only thing that, like, our locker room is focused on. And that's the only thing I was focused on. Like, as much as I want to go out there and throw a bunch of touchdowns, stuff like that, like, being able to get a win, like you said, at Richardson against a real, um, really good football team there and then come defend our home field against, you know, a team that we played in the playoffs here before that. And we knew that they were hungry and they had a new coach and a new culture that they were trying to set too. It's like, yeah, the stats matter, but at the end of the day, we were 2-0 and and I'm like, we were happy with that and we knew we hadn't played our best football yet. And so that's kind of like where we were at coming out of it. And like you said, going down the stretch, like, going into other games, like even that McMaster game, like we ran away with it at the end, but we were down at halftime against them and like running the locker room. Like it's like we're because of our experience in the other games and because of kind of, we know that we were able to win tight games. It's like when we went to locker room, we weren't blinking there. We knew that we were going to come out in the second half and play good football. Like because of, you know, we had a battle some adversity earlier in the year too. So for sure, it definitely helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we talked about this a little bit on the Laurier podcast that we did with Jack Moore, but there's something so impressive about having that confidence that, you know what, we've been here before. We've been in these tight games before. And honestly, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here and we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper, but I don't know if that Windsor game in the playoffs is different. If you guys don't go through the trials and tribulations that you do in the regular season here and the confidence that you have to come through that and to really kick things off and go into the rest of the season. Um, the one thing that I do want to ask, because we talked about the tough, the close games that were there, walk us through that Guelph game. Because you go, there's no touchdowns for the first two, they're tight games, and then seven total touchdowns against the Griffins. What's going through your head? Does the first one connect and you go, oh, damn, I'm feeling good here. This could be dangerous. What does that feel like? I feel like the Guelph game was kind of um, – it felt in my mind like that game, like, overdue. Like, we felt like we were playing good football the first two weeks, but obviously, like you said, we weren't put, scoring enough touchdowns. We weren't putting the ball in the end zone enough, and we were kind of just telling ourselves, like, trust the process. Keep playing good football. The results are going to come. And then on top of it, that Guelph game pregame, there was some there was some antics happening on the field, and so we were pretty fired up coming out of the gate for that one. And so – um, once we hit that first one right off the bat, we kind of just knew like this one's gonna be this one's gonna be fun, and we're not gonna take our foot off the pedal just because there was some there was some interesting stuff happening there. So um, it was kind of just one of those where it was like, all right, this is the time we're in the zone. Like, let's go, let's go put up a statement right now. You're just gonna leave us hanging with that antics? What the heck is going on? <laughs> this, is, this is like Giannis moving a ladder against like the Pacers. Like, what what the heck's going on? <laughs> I'm not gonna say names, but uh, there were some guys that wanted to try and take our footballs, kick them on the road, try and spit at us and stuff like that. There was some there was some disrespectful stuff going on, and so it was kind of just like a statement. Like, uh, we gotta remember what what we're dealing with here. Classic oh Griffs, eh? Classic Griffins. Awesome. Well, you know what? It, we had to get to that game eventually, and I want to dive into the numbers of that. Numbers are a very fun way of looking at your year, though, of course, there's so much more than the numbers. But specifically with that one, you finished with 451 in the air, the six touchdowns. Um, you know, I want to throw out some of the historical numbers to you because, you know what, as much as covering the league is sometimes tricky with the access there are to some of the all-time numbers and things. There's at least a document that, as far as I know, hasn't been updated. But as of your rookie season, has all the leaders and everything of that nature for all you know your major categories. So you put up 451 in the air against them. Do you have any sense where that compares in terms of the top single game production of a quarterback? We're turning this into the quiz hour all of a sudden, Algersma. <laughs> but you have a sense of you know growing growing playing football in the London area. You know this is a big part of of your world of where that number ranks in terms of an all-time production? Well, I know there was some games back in the day where guys were throwing the ball 70 times. <laughs> I can't Michael Falls, my coach, but uh, <laughs> I would say it's got to be top 10, right? You know what? It wasn't. The top number is 627 to 1. Greg Vavra of the Calgary um, of Calgary Dinos back in 85. But you bring up your guy in Falsey. Do you know what his single season or single game mark was from a season? Just the number. I'll I'll tell you, you 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 haven't you haven't bested him yet. He has your number in that. Five fifty, somewhere around that. It's five fifty on the nose. Last question. Oh, on this let's vein. go. Kids on a heater. Um, you had six passing touchdowns in that game. Do you know what Coach Fald's single game touchdown record was? He threw seven, didn't he? No, it also is six. And 
against against Mac, funnily enough. So you know what, Tom? Elgersma hung him on me, and you know, the 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 head coach and Paul hung him on your guys. Hey, so we're on the end of this one. But you know, again, and I'll pass the mic over to, to, to Tom. But when we look at your numbers, like you have to start framing in a historical context. Like how much of that was sort of at all on your mind throughout the season. I'm sure you have some people, I mean, you know, whether it's us, like Deshaun with Persevere starting to talk about the numbers in those contexts, whether or not like there's people in your life starting to murmuring it, murmuring about it. Like I'm sure, you know, it was still just next game mentality, but some of these numbers were outrageous. You were putting up this year. I think that, yeah, like you said, in season, um, it's important that I don't think about that stuff because that's how you go on runs where you continue to play really good football. If you start to focus on too much of that stuff while we're in season, then um, it can easily, you know, take away from my reads because I'm too worried about, you know, where I'm throwing the ball, how deep I'm throwing the ball, how much I'm throwing the ball, then I'm not focused on playing good football and just putting our team in the best spot to win. But I think, you know, postseason, like when you have a, a banquet like we do at the end of the year and you're, you know, they're celebrating with your guys on like, you know, what we did this year and like, how we're going to continue to grow on it next year. I think that's where you can kind of take it like a little bit of a step back and even, you know, spending some time in Galloway's office after the year and just talking, reflecting on the season is kind of like where you can be like, you know, I'm very thankful to be in the spot that I am, like having the guys around me that allow me to do that and having the coaching staff that let me, you know, play that way. And so I think that's kind of where it was like reflection, more like postseason, just looking at it and just being like, you know, I'm very thankful for my group and thankful for my coaches. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I love the fact that you brought up the numbers there, Zach, because I was doing some deep dives as well into this. And I don't know if it was actually properly shouted out or not, but according to this document here, which seems to have been updated as of 2022, um, we have a new single season passing yard record holder in one Taylor Elgersma here. The last one finished with Adam Sinagra, 3,233 yards and capped off by our guy on the pod here finishing in 2023 with 3,482 yards. So according to that, I don't know if you actually got your flowers for that, but congratulations on being the single season passing yard record holder. I appreciate it. Uh, (laughs) Snagger is a great name and a great quarterback. So it's, it's, it's awesome to be up there with guys like him. So speaking of the great quarterbacks, obviously you have one of the best as your head coach, when you're making the decision to even come to Laurier at the beginning of all of this, how much is his influence a part of your decision to come to Laurier, knowing the history that he has and the person that he is? A, a massive decider. I think that the coaching staff at Laurier is the main reason why I decided to come to Laurier. And I think it's because, you know, I when you are in the locker room with Folds and you hear how he talks and you um, see how he operates every single day, um, He's instilling a culture that's winning and he cares about his players so much. And that's the reason why we are who we are. It's not because we, you know, have had fancy things like everyone knows we've been a due for an upgrade and we're getting it now, but um, we're not built off like the fancy things and stuff like that. We're built off working hard and and being dogs and wanting to go out there and win football games. And that comes from coach faults and that comes from coach V and that comes from coach Galloway. And so I think that, you know, the coaching staff was like a massive reason why I decided to come here and specifically Falls being able to learn from him and me and him, our personalities are so, so, so similar that he understands, you know, some coaches don't love it that I, you know, get in there and block once in a while. And I just can't <laughs> like that, but he understands that that's coming from a competitive fire. And, and he always tells me that he'd rather, you know, try and reel me in than try and have to get a quarterback to, to bring up to that. So, um, just having someone that understands me and understands that, you know, drive to win, that drive to compete, that drive to work hard. Um, that's that's all the reasons why I came here. I I have to ask, have you watched the 2009 Yates Cup yet? Yes, but not in a long time. Okay, you have seen it. All right. One of arguably the greatest quarterback performances and gutsy as all hell. The dude your head coach, your guy, walks out there against Queen's defense, which is probably the best in the country and probably up there in top 10 best all time, with no knee and decides yeah. to just sling it and it has to be pulled off the through. field when he can't walk properly. That's a dog, man. <laughs> dog. And he threw some great balls. He gave his guys chances on those throws, too. Yeah, Tom has a TV in the house that just always has that game on. Replay. <laughs> it's just on a loop. It's actually right over here. It's just on a loop. <laughs> 
I, you know, Taylor talked about the function of having a class of guys within the same building and how that creates these these windows for winning championships and just having these stellar years. Also, when we look around the league and kind of from our vantage point of being fans and just enjoying what what you and your guys do, but you know, with the other eleven teams, you're part of like a really stellar class of quarterbacks across the league. And I, I think you know the COVID piece. It makes these things tricky of trying to figure out what your guys are truly in because of the allowance of the extra year. But, you know, I, I mean, off the jump, I mean, just you and Hillock kind of at, as the kings of the hill um, in terms of just like the top class. But then I think Keegan Hall, Skelton, Rekin, um, possibly Lefebvre as well, even though he obviously didn't start until this year. All guys that are in that third year, and I apologize if I'm forgetting anyone else. When you think of sort of the your your peers around the OUA, because it, it is such a competitive time right now, and you know we know so much that is at the quarterback level. If you don't have a guy, it's going to be really tough for you. Um, do you do you take time to kind of think about the the maybe we maybe we won't recognize it now, but maybe five years from now, even more so, being like man, from from twenty one to twenty to twenty twenty four to twenty twenty five, that was a a class of quarterbacks, the way we might go back and look at like when Falds and Brannigan were kind of at the top of the hill or when it, who, where, when it was whomever. Do you think about that? Because you're in the company. You're out there at the front of them, with the front with the best of them, but you're in some pretty great company right now. For sure. The quarterback play in the OEA right now is really good and it's really strong. And uh, like you said, there's a bunch of guys that are in my class that are playing really good football and like Hillick, Freakin, Keegan, all those guys. Like um, I know all those guys and they, and they can all sling the rock. And then even you can see it, coming up with young guys too with Guelph's got a couple of good young gunslingers over there and um you even see it across you know Canada right now I think like in general Canada right now has really good young quarterback play and um even guys from like you know out west and and uh Rooker and then guys like from Quebec with Seneca and Desjardins and so like Canadian quarterbacks are you know getting better and better every single year and I think that like you're going to start to see um this like yield at the next level because there's going to be guys like there's guys at our class and there's guys in the coming up classes that are going to deserve a shot and deserve a shot to go next level and go actually play pro and and kind of break that stereotype and you see it uh trey kind of paving the way for us but i think overall like the the quarterback um the canadian quarterback is in a good spot right now and we're all kind of um pushing to to be that that next guy that breaks kind of the barrier Mm -hmm. well since we're on the topic of your joint your fellow quarterbacks in the OUA, there's a, an interesting connection between you, Mr. and Mr. Hillock, and a few other of these young quarterbacks who may not be in the OUA or might be backups as of right now. And that's one Mr. Will Finch, Finch quarterback training. And I know that you've done some work with him, and I know Evan's done a fair bit of work as well. I think that was a big uh, influence in terms of why Evan wanted to go to Western in general. But talk about your experiences with Will. I know you've got some phenomenal coaches at Laurier, obviously, who are really up about your development. But what has that experience with Will Finch been like in order to really focus on the fundamentals of your game? Yeah, and um, so I started working with Will this offseason and um, really trying to like just refine technical stuff. Um, up until this point, a lot of it's been about my feet. I've been trying to make sure that you know my feet match my arm. And um, I'm just working with Will a lot about, you know, keeping my stroke compact. Um, And he's been kind of taking a lot of time to even just, he takes a lot of time to do video work with us. He he spends um, like every session's videoed. We get every session sent to us uh, via video and and he takes the time to review it. And and he's um, just been awesome for me just to have like someone to be in my ear as I'm throwing, talking me through every single rep, um, reminding me of cues and stuff like that, of that I need to remember. And, and then having someone to like talk with after a session about stuff that I can work on throughout the week with him. So it's been, it's been awesome working with Will. And like, I see why he was so such a great quarterback when he was, you know, playing. And that's why it's, it's great for me to be able to work with him. I, I appreciate uh, uh, all the time that I spent with him. You know, Taylor, to, to go back a little bit into the numbers of the year, but also allowing you to not, now talk about some of your teammates um, who I know you have such a great connection with. And when you see like you guys, like the the passion you all share, again, that's one of those things that you just see. And it's like, yep, check that box. You can't necessarily put it on paper, but the way your team is, that close-knit nature that no doubt Coach Falls instills. But 
you know, the numbers are so just outrageous across the board, whether it's the the touchdowns in the air, you add in the, the rushing touchdowns, 24 combined, 18 in the air, six rushing, the yards per game are outrageous. But the number that jumps off the board to me is that 75.2 completion percentage. When you, again, compare it to the all-time stats, it has you tied in third, except the number one and second in, in, in average only had 90 and 87 attempts, respectfully. You had 274 this year. So that's 75 stands out and again i said not only because it speaks to the the talent that you have but um you know uh you're, you're with two non-quarterbacks in the room but i would assume much of that has to do with the connection you have with your guys and the trust when you put balls on these guys that they're going to bring them down it all fits within the scheme and you know we talk about thorn and jordan so much um and rightfully so but what was so impressive was you would have games where like, I don't know if it's just like, okay, hey, clearly they're going to lock in on Thorne and Jordan this week. And now all of a sudden, you know, Jace Atkinson and Leomi Ojitalayo and and Stebbings and, and, and Basic Hayden and all these guys are getting, you know, their reps where like, as a, you can imagine, defensively, you can't even prepare for it. But so just speak to the preparation, the connection you have with your skill position guys, obviously not to exclude what uh, Quentin Scott and Taryn Elms do in the backfield for you. But just with that, um, receiver group that you have to be able to have that 75 record setting record breaking in many ways completion percentage I imagine that comes down to a lot of the chemistry you have with them for sure it starts with the trust we have with each other like you talked about our locker room is so close we love each other at Laurier football and and like our receiver room is is so tight and, and everyone wants success for each other and I think that's where it starts is everyone understands that we got to play within a system we all trust uh, Coach Galloway with the system he's implementing and and the reason why like each week, a different guy can have a breakout game. Um, Jackson Stebbin goes off for a couple touchdowns in one game. Jace Atkinson goes off for over 100 in a touchdown in another game. We already talked about Laomi. Like, the ball can get spread because we all trust the system and we don't run routes for ourselves. We run routes for each other. And we understand that certain weeks it's going to be certain guys and certain weeks it's going to be other guys. And that comes, like you said, because of like how close we are as a team. Um, everyone wants success for our group. They don't just want self-success. And, you know, it'd be easy for, you know, the other guys when it's when it's EJ's week or it's Ray's week or um, to be all, you know, upset if they're not getting the ball as much or vice versa. But when you watch any one of our guys catch a touchdown, the first guys running down there are the rest of the receiver group. And they're just as excited and they want to celebrate in the end zone just as much as anyone else. And I think um, having like a skill group that, you know, understands how deep we are and how good we are across the board, it's easy because everyone respects that every single guy on that offense could make a game-changing play. And and no one thinks they're better than the rest of the group. And everyone um, understands like their role and plays within the system. I think that comes down to completion percentage as well. That's how you get a completion percentage like that is you have to play within the system. You have to take the throws that are given to you. And I, I think if you if you just try and force the ball to certain guys and just um, play outside of the system, then, then you're not going to get that. And so I think it all kind of works hand in hand, the chemistry, playing within the system, and kind of the love for each other. Mm -hmm. Now, sticking with that system kind of view here, we've mentioned his name a couple of times, and I know we've already given your flowers, our flowers to uh, Coach Falds, and he deserves all of them for the incredible person that he is, first and foremost, and then the football coach. But I wanted to take an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about Todd Galloway, because the dude has such an unbelievable track record, even just from myself. You know, anytime his name is even mentioned, Zach's face lights up because he loves the man. He, he, comes over to Mac for one year, brings us our first Yates Cup since 2014 when I played, and now he's over at Laurier and really starting to establish something special. Not even starting to, has established something special. Talk about your relationship with him and how he interacts with the entire offense to make you as high-powered as you are. Yeah, me and first of all, with me and Coach Gallagher's relationship, we, I have an unbelievable relationship with him. I'm, I'm in the meeting room every single day for – hours on hours in season with him and out of season, we still meet um, all the time. And just sometimes it's X's and O's. Sometimes it's just talking football. Sometimes it's just talking life. And uh, like it starts with, he's an amazing person and he cares about his players and he understands football. Like at a level that's um, above. And what I'll say is above all the DCs in the OUA. He, <laughs> I trust him. I trust him. Uh, call and plays for us every single day of the week. And I trust every single thing that he installs. And I think the um, our relationship is also so strong because 
um, the trust we have with each other. We communicate really well. He listens and and hears what I have to say on stuff. And, you know, that comes a long way, you know, because he understands that I have the ball in my hands and I understand that he has the playbook in his hands. And so we kind of um, communicate a lot and that that that's why our relationship is so good. Um, and then how he interacts with the whole offense is um, everyone trusts him, not only because I trust him, but because it's easy to see like when he's on there and he's talking film and he's going through X's and O's and he's installing plays and he's bringing stuff down. You know that he knows what he's talking about. You know that he knows what we need to do to succeed. And so it's easy to follow a guy that um, is that, you know, uh, calculated with what he's doing and that smart with football. You can see it. You can tell when you're in a room with someone that knows and understands football. And, and so it's easy for us guys to follow him when he's in charge. And I found he made things easy to understand. Like he has a lot of intelligence, as he said, but he doesn't complicate it. He just makes it understandable, which from offensive lineman's perspective, For as long sure. as we, we need to know five things. And if we know those things, <laughs> y'all can do your work. Tell him, though, he owes you about 62 yards on your single game record because he was able to drop a design for Jazz Lindsay to get 513 yards against Western back in 2014. Ooh. And, you know, straight arm talent, straight arm talent. I might take you over my guy, Jazz. So he's he's shortchanging you a little <laughs> bit. Tell him tell him he owes you a couple there. I'll make um, sure. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, again, kind of looking around the league with the talent because, you know, when we had you on, uh, you know, it was, it was like early, it was pretty much like three years ago, right now in, in 21, before you'd even stepped on the field, um, you know, we're talking about all these things. And of course you being a London guy and, you know, you, you've obviously had this past year with the, the two times coming short once in the Yates, of course. Um, but you had the semifinal the year before, and there's definitely been a market improvement in, in those games. Uh, just generally, what's it been like for you as a London guy growing up, you know, no doubt spending a lot of time down. Uh, at Western, playing with the the junior Mustangs, and probably just going to games as a kid, and the the London football scene, which I came to admire and and really appreciate my time being there, and just being a London kid, and now being the 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 chief opponent to the Western Mustangs as the team that in the minds in the eyes and minds of of folks like Tom and myself are on a level right now with that team. What is that like for you? coming from uh coming from london well honestly recently it's been a little bit frustrating because you haven't got the job done um, <laughs> that's what i care about most i mean obviously going back to the hometown is nice and and obviously you talked about it. the london football culture is unbelievable and it starts with the junior mustangs and it, and it leads up into the amazing alumni and stuff that western has and and i i can't say enough about coach marshall and how great of a guy he is i um he did he was very nice to me this season and and help me, you know, bring my grandpa to games and stuff like that so that I, he could see me play in London and stuff like that. So I can't say enough about um, the class there. But, um, yeah, I, I'm going there to win football games, and that's ultimately the only thing I'm thinking about when I go into London. And, um, obviously, it's it's frustrating coming out of those games uh, not on top. And um, I try not to think about anything else when I'm going there right now. Like, it's all about winning football games. It's all about when you go through the Yates Cup, I – we we could play that in the parking lot for all I care. I just want to win the Yates Cup. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of been the mindset. But it is nice to go back to the hometown, have family around, have, you know, um, Junior Mustang family around um, from people that I used to play with and ex-coach and stuff like that. And, and everyone's always so welcoming. So it does kind of feel um, like I'm going back home when I go there for sure. I want to jump back into the, the the regular season here and start talking about a few of these games. We talked about the earlier parts of of the year, certainly with uh, Queens and Carlton coming out against Guelph, and you mentioned a little bit being down to McMaster and then coming back and really uh, running away with it here. You've obviously had a lot of success at Laurier, playing against certain teams in certain situations here. I would argue as a team, there was nothing more impressive than your win against Windsor in the regular season here. We hyped this up. Zach and I hyped this up as the battle of the undefeated here. Windsor's coming off and they look damn good. That defense looked like it was the best in the country. And Danny Skelton, the three-headed monster that they had as running backs there. And then they come to town and your boys hang 40 on the best defense at the time in the country and only allow seven. Talk to me about that dominating win in that regard here, because like I said, like this was no joke. We were really debating on, holy crap, like is it 
a Laurier or Windsor that really has the opportunity to go against the the Mustangs here, and you flexed your muscles pretty hard in that regular season. What was that like? Walk us through that. Windsor is uh, is a tough football team to play, and we knew that coming in. We knew that they're uh, kind of built similar to us. Like they they come with that uh, dog mentality. They come to get in a fist fight, and so do we. And that's kind of what we took with the approach of that game. Is we said, you know, that was kind of our mantra the whole week. Is we know they want to come here and get in a fight, and and that's what we love to do. And so let's go out there and show them who like the real bullies are. And that was kind of our kind of mindset uh, pregame was just we know they got dogs over there. Like I can't give enough credit to Mufta. Like. He is a beast in that and them inside and Kalade. We know that D line is special and and they and they like to fly around and hit hard. Um, but we knew that we can we can bang with anyone um in the country and our defense hits just as hard. And um and our offensive line played a hell of a game that game, uh holding those guys um um uh, holding them holding them to like nothing. Like we were that first game, especially, we were really taking control of that. And so can't give enough credit to the boys up front for we're hanging in there with that tough group and and uh yeah that that one felt a little bit like a statement game for us with like we know this is a tough opponent opponent and we we went out there and played some really good football Yo, I love that you're highlighting some of those individuals um especially yeah with that defensive line um because it was incredible watching what they were doing and and of course your defense was was right up there any given week who's who's the top of that mountain could you know there's three or four really good options you have at the top of the OUA you know, we talk about the connection to London and, and the battles you've had with them. Obviously, the Waterloo piece, Battle of Waterloo, um, knowing what that is sort of as the geographic rivalry. I love that Tom brings up that Windsor game. Guelph, it seems like there's, uh, you know, <laughs> something in the water, maybe a little bit of bad blood there. Uh, who like who is who are some of the game, uh, the teams, whether it's an individual that, you know, just like through playing in the league now a couple of years, maybe a guy you played with growing up you know, team O type stuff like that, who, you know, lines up a- across you on a certain matchup um, that you're just, you're just that much more excited to do battle with or it, whomever it might be. Are there guys that you kind of have um, for whatever reason as being like, Oh, I can't wait till I get to see Miller Melanson in that secondary and, you know, try to put him to work and things like that. Yeah. I mean, um, believe it or not, I think a lot of my guys that I love to go against are actually D linemen. And I think that's because when I'm looking at the secondary, I see secondary in terms of coverages. I don't. I, I look at guys and I and I look at who you know who obviously their best defenders are in man. And I'm not saying that um, I don't you know properly make sure I know who I'm throwing against. But I see secondary a lot in terms of coverages. And I trust that if teams are going to line up in man against us, that I trust my guys to win, no matter who they're lined up against in the league. And so um, I know who I have a receiver. And so I try and really focus on the coverages. So the guys that I kind of really like to go against are a lot of times D linemen because a lot of times they're the ones in your ear. They're the ones that are nice and close that you can easily have conversations with. So a guy that quickly comes to mind is like Tyson Hergott from Waterloo. Um, me and him have a great relationship and and I know how good of a football player he is and and he's a beast and over there. And so, and, you know, having the battle of Waterloo there, having to get into talk with him all the time is it is a fun one. And, and honestly that Windsor D line, as much as we don't like each other, um pre-game it's always chippy with them and and they understand what kind of game it's going to be and we understand what kind of game it's going to be and, and i think there's that mutual respect among guys that you know are competitors among the league is they understand like what happens in between the whistles and how hard you're playing and the trash talk and everything like that that comes with the desire to win and that um and so a lot of times it's like those those big tier d linemen that i find even ife on yekka on on carlton i had a a bunch of good conversations with him throughout those games and, and he hits hard and and I love it because uh when they smoke me and I get up and I smile at them or or when we throw a touchdown and I talk some shit it's just it's all uh it's all love at the end of the day and I think they understand that from competitors so that's that's what kind of like the love and the fire of the game comes from there's so many times where I've had conversations with some of my friends who haven't played university football. And when I try to explain that idea, especially like when you're in training camp and you're going up against the first team defense game after game after game after game. And eventually by the second week, your fists start flying. People start getting animated. And then immediately as you leave, you go into the mess hall. You're like, yeah, I got you with a good right hook. Hey, yeah, I got you. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't played doesn't understand. It. It's it's the strangest thing, but there's a certain level of camaraderie, even amongst your own team against other players. When you're going at it, one of my favorite guys to go up against was uh, Donnie Egerter, and he and I would go back and forth in those Guelph games. And it's it's just a it's a crazy thing, but 
the competition, the brotherhood that's there, whether it's on your same team or other teams, it's just constantly there. So even when when you're really playing against guys who know it, you talk that smack and you you hit them with hard as as hard as you can, and then right afterwards, it's all it's all love and respect. For sure, for sure. That's that's the amazing part about football. That's what we're all so similar. As much as you know, we're all for our own teams, and we all you know go into battle every single week, like. If we were teammates with any guys in the OUA, we're all football players, we're all competitors, we all want to win, and, and we'd all be close. And so that's kind of where that mutual respect comes from, especially when you see guys that have that same fire that you do, that have the same drive to win and take their game to the next level. It's it's mutual respect. And in between the whistles, you you compete, and that's honestly how you show the respect is by is by willing to compete your ass off against those top guys and, and back up what what you have to say, and they back up what they have to say. And then at the end of the game, you shake hands, you say, good luck, and you say, good, have a rest of the have a good rest of the season. And so that's kind of, uh, that's definitely um, a, a part I love about this game and, and meeting guys throughout the league has been, has been awesome. It's it's, and it's very evident to all of us that you love the game itself and you're very good at what you do. Um, I'd be remiss if we didn't have a chance to talk about the Western Mustangs and that rivalry that's there. Now, we talked about it a little bit in the our last podcast that we did uh, talking about Western here and the idea that maybe in the past there was this gap between number one, number two, and the rest of the league here. Western is really showcasing things. And I think that gap has considerably shortened in terms of the teams who are there and who are ready to compete. Certainly, you guys were there in both of the, the matches that were there. And even walking through, we'll start with the, the regular season game to start with. It's 27 nothing going into halftime. People are lighting up me and Zach saying we are idiots for picking Laurier to win this game when it looks like it's going to be brother. (laughs) It looks like it's going to be a blowout. And then once again, you have one of these Laurier flex moments and hang 28 unanswered in the third quarter. Now, obviously, the game doesn't end how you how you want to. Jerome Rancourt comes in there and he's able to get a pass off. And they're pretty damn good at what they do, certainly. But talk me through what the mentality is going into halftime. And how do you guys not lose faith when it's 27 to nothing against the number one team in the nation? I think that. Um, a, it comes from confidence and belief, like we talked about. I, We and everyone in that locker room believes that we're the best team in the nation, and and I think that we know that we can play with them, and we know that it's not um, – when we're looking across from them, we know that we're right there with them, and I think that's where it starts is if you go into that game – I think a lot of teams go into that game thinking they're going to lose. I'll never go into a game thinking that we're going to lose that game, and and even though that result didn't go that way or the, or the eighth cup, it's not going to change uh, our belief in our locker room of what we have and how good we are. And so I think that's where it starts. And then it also comes down to just realizing we got to execute and play football. And I think sometimes, you know, that game was a 7-0, 7-0 game. It's all this hype. And I think, you know, sometimes you come out and you're just not, you're not playing your best ball. And they came out firing. They came out of the gate ready to roll. And and I think when we went into halftime, it was just like, we know that we can play with these guys. They just threw up 27. Let's go do what we can do and and get this thing done. And my only regret from that second half is that we kind of, I felt like we took our foot off the gas a little bit. When we got back up 28, 27, it was almost like, okay, we're good. Let's go. Instead of keep, keep going, keep pounding. And I think that's um, where my only regret would be from that game is like, we know we can play with them. And once we scored that first touchdown, we knew that we were going to get right back in the game. But um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating memories for sure. But uh it's part of football, and and it's, and it makes us a better team at the end of the day. And so we're we're only going to get better from it. Well, you talk about you know sort of reflecting on that game, thinking about the experience of being at the Yates Cup. You know, the year before semifinal, you make the semifinal run. You kind of getting your feet wet. You know, demonstrating that Carlton team in that Carlton game in the quarters, like just how electric you guys are. That you aren't a joke, and that everything that we've been seeing was for real. You know, you, you fall to them in semis. You have that tight matchup in the regular season, the end of this year, then going into the eights. What were the things, what were the lessons from that game, almost aside from the football itself of just getting up from that game? Or were you able to just think, hey, it's another, it is another game. But in the, uh, in the you know, knock on wood that you are there with your boys again this year, what are the things that you now have in your bag of tricks sort of anticipating as far as the day goes, 
obviously, it could, you know, it was on the road. Maybe it's at home the next time around. But all those things that make that a, a different game than all others, or or were you able to think of it as just it's football? I think that um, the important thing to remember when you're playing a Yates Cup is that the Yates Cup isn't the final trophy. You know, the Yates Cup is the path to the Vanier Cup, and we want to win Vanier Cups over here. And so that's kind of the mindset that. Um, you know, next year when we're back in that spot, we're going we're to frame it as. And I think, you know, going into last year, it was almost like Yates Cup, Yates Cup week, Yates Cup week. And it almost made it into the championship game, which it is. And and don't get me wrong, like I've heard you guys talk about and I've heard people that want to talk about the Yates Cup can almost be more enjoyable than winning the Vanier Cup. It's such a special trophy. But when you frame in the mindset of we're trying to win a national championship, we're trying to go in a Vanier Cup, that's only... Um, that's only one game on that path. We still got two more games after that to go. And so I think that um, that's kind of what our mindset is going into next year is that um, this year was just our stepping stone, but but we got to take two steps next year. We're not going to just win the Yates Cup and stop. We got to go win the Yates Cup, go win um, a semifinal, national semifinal, and then go then go get the job done in the Vanier. So that's mm-hmm. kind of that's kind of what the mindset's going to be going into next year. And when we we talk about that idea of getting better, and we mentioned it a little bit when we were talking with Jack Moore on the last podcast, but in 22, you guys go five and three. Your losses are to Ottawa, Queens, and then Western. And this year you make that big step and you finish seven and one. And obviously Western is still at the end of the at, end of the road there. But what was that jump like to go into improving from five and three to seven and one? What would what do you think were the biggest aspects of that? Is it just another year under your belt? Is it more chemistry with the team? How how much did that influence or what was it that went from five and three to seven and one? And what are you actively doing now to go from seven and one to eight? No. Yeah. I think that um, a lot of it is um, having another year under our belt because the five and three year, that was in my mind kind of our first year as it being our group taking it over. And we made mistakes that you would see from a first year group making it over, t- taking over turnovers. Um, where there was half, so we turned the ball over three, four times in one half in that year. And um, just not scoring our red, our score zone percentage was down. And I just think that, you can see uh, the learning happening throughout the year. And the kind of the Carlton game at the end of that year kind of was showing, yes, this is what it looks like when it all comes together. And so going into this year, I think we knew what like our floor was and, and, and we knew how high our ceiling could be. And we had that belief and trust that um, there wasn't as much feeling it out. It was let's hit the ground running. And so that kind of led into last year. And I think, Going into this year, it's all about details. It's all about finding the ways that we can – that defenses attack us and we can counter that. We know we do some things on offense that are really, um, really, really good, and we know that there's certain ways that teams like the Westerns, like Max with a great DC, like Brady or Windsor, um, try and take away. And so Queens has a, has a great defense scheme over there. And so it's all about right now trying to um, – find ways to counter that we know what we can do and we know we can execute we just need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best best position come those fourth quarters those big fourth quarters because we know we can play with anyone in the country it's just about making sure we we take advantage of our, our opportunities when they come last question i have for you taylor and it does touch back again to our conversation we had about three years ago um because you made it to that yates and i asked you then late february 2021 what the song was going to be when you eventually led your team to a Yates Cup and you told me, well, it's got to be something country, probably Luke Combs. Was it in fact Luke Combs you listened to <laughs> running out of the field? And if not, what was the song running out for your first Yates Cup? Well, I think because it was out Western when we ran out, it was something stupid. But um, <laughs> if it was up to me, I, I, we would have we would have stuck country. Probably would have gone different round here, Riley Green. Um, you know, I'm a country boy. The guys know pregame. I'm walking around the field singing my country music. Probably probably pissing off the other team, and and I do that kind of intentionally. Walk around the field, let them know that I'm having some fun out there, and, and our guys love it. So definitely would stick within the country realm for sure. <laughs> I love it, man. Um, now I wanted to dive into the uh the other question or the other answer that you kind of gave me there in terms of understanding the details and understanding the ideas of where you're trying to get better. 
obviously, I, and I don't want to keep harkening back to the loss here because I know that those are painful memories here. But when you go into that Yates Cup and yep. you're looking around and it's 14 to 8 at halftime and now you guys have the lead here. Is there that same level of, hey, you know what, we've got this here and almost not, I, I don't want to say that you guys took your foot off the gas, but it, did you have that same kind of feeling there? And then after that, when you're looking at this game here, you put up 14 in that second quarter and then you don't put up anything in the in the second half. When you're looking at that from an offense and from your own personal development, are you now understanding, like you said, hey, this is what Western is really good at is making those second half adjustments. Maybe we didn't necessarily have that. We didn't have a game plan, whatever that looked like. Are you now more well-informed and feel even more confident going up against the Westerns of the world because of those experiences? Talk to me about how you feel now after having played those two tough games. Yeah, um, it definitely includes uh, the Western games, but you also see it in like the Windsor game, the second half, you know, um, defenses by the end of last year did a really good job of trying to take away the things that we do well. Um, our zone read game, um, they were playing light in the box to us a lot, trying to force gives and because they know that, you know, that's a super successful part of our game, getting the ball into our playmakers hands in space and um, um, even Western was playing some cover two to double tight end sets. Um, stuff like that is just they're trying to take away stuff that we do well. And so um, understanding that we've kind of seen the Rolodex now, um, we see it from Mac every single year with Brady. He brings all sorts of crazy zone blitz pressures at us, the muddle fronts. You see it from Queens with the 30 front and and bringing different stunts and, and playing cover four behind it. So we've seen kind of the Rolodex of ways that teams are going to try and kind of stifle our offense and make us um, – beat them in different ways. And so I think this is all about prepping ourselves the best we can for the answers we've seen and the answers that we might not have seen yet. Cause um, we know that these DCs are smart and we know that, that they're going to not just sit there and, and play base cover one against us and base cover three. They've seen what we do to that. So they know that um, there's going to be some different, we know there's going to be some different answers from them. And so it's all about um, making sure that we're as well prepped through this off season so that it's not um, necessarily feeling like an adjustment in a halftime of a game, in a halftime of a Yates Cup or a playoff game. It's more just, okay, this is what they're doing. Let's go back to something that we do well that counters that. And just kind of – that's kind of the next evolution of our offense, I think, is is kind of building off of the things that we maybe haven't shown as much that we're going to kind of try and counter with next year. You know, I have to go back to the numbers one last time before I, I pass the Tom to wrap, but – with the numbers you did this year on the career, you're sitting at 5,978 yards. Now, we're talking a lot these days about the combines, about the draft coming up. And a year from now, no, almost no matter what happens at OUA season, we're going to be talking about your name with that upcoming draft in 2025 in late February and March. And I think most people and expecting you to only get better in your personal development and your growth as a player expect you to your name to be called on that, Dan. We're getting way ahead of ourselves, but I only bring it up to say this. That if we go through that process, whatever happens at summer training camps, you then come back for a fifth year at Laurier. From where you stand right now, Taylor, you had 2641 in the air this year. If we just round that down a little bit and say you get us two more 2,500 yard seasons, it won't give you first place, but it will put you over your head coach all time in Michael Falls. He had 10,811, yet I'm looking at the numbers here. I think somehow he managed to only do that in four years, or I, I don't know how he's doing it. Again, though, Taylor. Like, you know, with everything you've been doing, it, it, yeah, it, you force us to try and pull up these all time things because it's been an all time career you're putting together. And we're so lucky that it hasn't hasn't been wrapping that it's so far from wrapping up the MVP. And we know, obviously, a little more hardware that you're looking to add to the trophy case, though. But like, it's been such a pleasure watching you play your career so far this year, Taylor. I'll, I'll let Tom wrap up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had. I'd be remiss if I didn't say how big of fans that we are of your game. Um, we talked about it a lot with with Jack, and he kind of confirmed it. The way that you carry yourself, the way that the team respects the words that you say, it really is something impressive that's here. And I really want to end off this final uh, question that I have with looking forward into 2024, because if everything kind of works out selfishly for Laurier and for us, and Cooper Hamilton comes back, 
you return pretty much your entire offense with the exception of Tanner Nelms and Quentin Scott's no pushover either. You have arguably one of, if not the best receiving cores in the country here with your guys that love to just do, hey, you know what? I'm going to have the game today. You know what? No, I, I got this one, the next one. And Raiden Thorne still, I've said this a few times now, some of the best hands that I've ever seen here. Talk about the excitement that's within that locker room, that's even in some of the offseason trainings going into 24 and knowing the potential that you guys have. You, you, you felt it in 23, but now, once again, another year of development, another year of understanding of the teams that are coming at you and what they might be coming at you with. Talk to me about what it feels like in those offseason trainings going into 24. The, ener- the energy is great right now, and I think, like, especially recruits see it when they come to our spring practices, our intensity is high. Um, It comes from our coaching staff. It comes from the drive within our locker room and it comes from our leadership group. And I think that's kind of the thing that um, my personal goal has been here is that create the culture, like culture doesn't graduate. And you see that with these, these programs that continue to win year after year. And so uh, we have the coaching staff to create that culture and kind of our group, I think is setting that culture. That's never going to graduate. And that's at least our goal as kind of our wave coming up is, and, 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 our, our group as captains that we've kind of talked about that is making sure we set that. And and that starts with next year is, is our talk and meetings is all about we're competing with the best in the country right now. We know where our ceiling is. We know that we can go in a Vanier cup next year. And so um, everything we do is focused on all those top teams. You look at the West and it's the Queens is the Ottawa's, you know, all the teams in our league, the Windsors that are great. But then you also look at the teams across the countries, the UBC's, the Lavals, the Montreals that we're going to have to go compete against if we want to get this thing done. And so um, every single week we're talking about in meetings is, is, is we're not only beating um, the teams in our conference, but we're beating the teams across the country that we need to beat and work ethic to get where we want to be. And so our energies are super high. Our practices are super intense, kind of like we talked on before. And, and uh, we know what we have to have to do to compete to win. And then we're just excited to get out there and do it. Well, as are we, Taylor, because as much as the numbers and what you do all season long justifies that when we pick you guys to beat Western, it would sure make it easier for us <laughs> when you actually eventually and repping every other team in the OE way because there's no love lost when someone knocks off the Western Mustangs do eventually do that. Um, Taylor, again, uh, thank you f- so much for joining us. Um, yeah, this is so cool having you on. Keep doing your thing and, uh, you know, best of luck in the rest of your off season and moving into what will certainly be a phenomenal 2024 season for your team and in the OUA. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it, guys. And just coming from a, from a player's perspective, we really appreciate everything you guys do, bringing the attention to us and, and bringing OUA football the love that it deserves. And, uh, and so I can't thank you guys enough for having me on. Thank you so much, Taylor. Uh, that's a wrap on this episode. Next year, you're going to be hearing from me and Tom. We're going to do a few interviews leading into the draft with some folks that went through that experience and made their way into the next to the next level. Who those folks will be, well, you have to stay tuned. So tune in right here at the 55.